So welcome to Mass Wildlife's Angler Education Program's Learn to Fish presentation. I'll be your host, Jim Legacy. And as your host, I've also been the coordinator of the Angler Education for Pro Program for many, many years now. And, and with that, we get the same themes over and over and over in our programs. A lot of questions, comments, concerns about fishing. So we put this um, hour between an hour and two hour presentation together um, with a lot of those themes to hopefully give you the confidence to fish. Um, this is the content overview. We're gonna get into a lot here in this presentation, and, but, it, but it will give you, hopefully will give you the confidence to get out and try it on your own. Fishing is not particularly difficult. Mass Wildlife wants you to get out and care about the outdoors and fishing is an easy way to do it. Um, so hopefully this uh, fills the bill. So what we're gonna cover, we're gonna, we're gonna cover knowing the rules with any pastime at all. No matter what you're getting into, there are gonna be rules associated with it. So knowing the rules is huge. Picking a great location obviously is, is very important. Getting the right equipment to use. Um, we see this all the time at our fishing events, folks bringing you know, massive saltwater rods to freshwater events. So getting the right equipment is key. <clears throat> Using the right bait, knowing the right bait and how to use it is also important. Targeting the right fish. A lot of times it just starts with what you wanna fish for and you build back from there. And we'll explain that. Know what to do after the catch. Some people it's just about having fun, getting outside, touching, feeling nature, catch and release in the fish. Other people are motivated by, by um, putting something in the freezer for, for, for future food, for dinner, for that evening. So everyone has a little different motivations. So what to do after the catch, that's kind of important. And then be re being responsible and ethical while you're out there. Um, there. There is, I mean, this is, you have to care about the outdoors to do this. You should care about the outdoors. You want this. To, to be available to future generations, your children, your grandchildren. So being responsible and ethical while you're out fishing kind of ensures that uh, hopefully that's gonna be around. So let's get right into it. Let's start by knowing the rules. And that's gonna be, you know, fishing licenses uh, for folks in certain ages, the rules and regulations um, regarding fishing, and then some fish identification for you. So who needs a license and where to buy it? Um, that is like the number one question in all of our fishing clinics, family fishing festivals, and just inquiries from the public. Um, do I need a license? And, and where can I get this license? So for freshwater fishing, anyone under 15 years old, um, there is no license needed. So in every state is a little different. Here in Massachusetts, it's 14 years and below, you don't need a license. You still have to obey by all the rules and we'll get into those, but you won't need a license until you get the 15. 15 plus, the license is required. Now with saltwater fishing, it's a little different. They call it a permit, but under 16, so 15 and under, you don't need that, that permit. Um, it's very similar to a license. It's just, it's just mixing terms, basically permit license. Um, and then um, so again, 16 plus, you have to have the, their permit. Now, all of these are based on a calendar year. So if you're buying it like in June or July or August, you've got the, the balance of the year to use it. If you're buying it in January, you've got the entire year to use it. And, and people are motivated to, some people like to go ice fishing. So they're going to buy it either December or first of the year to fish the entire year. And other people just want to fish a little in the summer. So they'll buy it in the summer. Best place to buy it is right on our website. Um, and that's, that's the Mass Fish Hunt tab on our website. And you'll wanna consult a current copy of the Massachusetts Fishing and Hunting Guide um, because it could be different prices um, per year. So, you know, I'm not gonna give you the current prices right now because it, it, you may be watching this 10 years from now. So um, consult a current copy of that. And that copy is important too. You can get right on our website um, or at some of our licensed vendors. Very important to have because it has all the, the fishing and hunting regulations as well. So consult that current copy for current um, license pricing. So do I need a license to take my child fishing? That is a question we get all the time. And, and it's a difficult one because it's, there's no yes, no exact answer. It is always best to have the license. Your license dollars help us conserve our fish and wildlife resources. So that money is important to us. Um, to manage the resource. So if you care about your state fish and wildlife agency, it's not a bad idea to, to have that fishing license because that goes to everything that we do. 
So, so from that perspective, it's important to have, plus you'll have more fun just knowing that you can actively participate. Um, you know, and sometimes that is spontaneous. I mean, sometimes you're out there and all of a sudden your little one catches a big fish, you know, oh my God, that looked like a blast. And I want to try that. And then, oh, I don't have a license. So remember 15 and above, you have to have that license to, to play. So it's always best to have it when you take the little ones out. And, and the other basic reason is sometimes you actively have to grab that rod and reel and help them. So you do need a license if you are casting the line for them or reeling the line in for them. And that is, um, that's a, you know, basically if you're part um, helping them control the rod and reel, you're jumping in there and you really are fishing and you need to have that license. You do not need a license to help them untangle their, their, their help them with their bait, to untangle their fishing line, to unhook their fish, you know, to get, to help them get the fish out of the, you know, the, the, the line out of the weeds, that kind of thing. So um, most environmental police officers that we've consulted, and we consult with them all the time on this, just to make sure they will not, um, um, you know, cite you if you're if you're just assisting your child or grandchild or friend or relative. But the minute you grab the rod and you're starting to, to actually fish on your own, you're controlling that rod and reel and you need to have the license. So, um, so just be mindful of that. And again, where to get it, the best places, on your device, on your, your desktop, your laptop, right on our website. But we do have licensed vendors around the state too. Um, and you can buy them at some of those too. So are there size and catch limits um, in terms of fishing? Yes, <laughs> there always will be. And again, this is this varies from state to state, country to country, province to province, if you're fishing in Canada. So if you plan on taking a trip out of, out of the state or out of the country, know the rules and regulations. Uh, most all jurisdictions have them. Um, here in Massachusetts, we are fortunate in that we don't necessarily like overregulate. I wouldn't say any state that really overregulates, but um, it's very simple here. Um, we have regulations on certain species. And those regulations are basically how many fish in that species you can keep per day, um, and then how and, and what size they need to be to keep. And we're fairly easy here in Massachusetts. We're lucky you can fish pretty much in most public water bodies 365 days a year seven days a week and 24 hours a day kind of thing um, there are certain water bodies that have open and closed seasons but they're very few and these are public water bodies so if you're not sure if it's public make sure that there are certain um, lake association waters uh, town and jurisdiction waters that, that do have closed seasons um, and some are closed entirely if they're water resource water so water supplies so just know that don't just assume that every place is open but the vast majority of water bodies whether it's ponds lake rivers reservoirs um, rivers and streams in this state are open year round so but with that there are size and catch limits so limits imposed currently right now on on most of what we consider the larger game fish species so the bass, the pike, the pickerel, the trout, um, the river fish like shad and walleye, muscalunch, those larger kind of the apex predators, the larger predators that are out there, there are size limits. And, and, and currently here it's, you know, for say large pile bass, very popular fish, it would be five fish per day you can keep and they have to be a minimum of 12 inches in size to keep. Um, so, but again, consult the current copy of our, our fishing and hunting guide. Um, um, for your for the current regs on that particular year. They do change. Um, again, we're lucky in this state that, that, that it's not per region or per water body so much. If you went to you know, northern New England or out west somewhere, the, the guide is really thick and it's per region or even per water body, it can change. So you really have to be cognizant of that if you're taking a trip or, or even just in certain areas of Massachusetts, it can change a little bit by certain water bodies, but that's all explained out in the guide. So have a, have a copy with you or have access to it on your device. So the, the, the species that generally there's no limits imposed are the species that are a little bit more prolific. Um, some people would say the smaller species, and yeah, sometimes they are your typical bluegills, pumpkin seed, um, calico bass perches, um, generally are, are a bit smaller than some of the bigger game fish species, but they can be pretty large too. And, they, and there's no, right now, there's no current size limit on them and current amount you can keep per day. Um, and of course, certain catfish and, and, and common carp can be some of the biggest fish in the entire state. Carp can go 25, 30, 35 pounds. And then some of the catfish species can go really big too. And you haven't lived until you've seen a five pound 
four or five foot long American eel at the end of your line. So they can go pretty large too. So they aren't always small fish, but they're, they're generally fish that are a little bit more prolific, a little lower on the food chain. Um, and they, they make up a larger base, fisheries base in most waters. So we don't feel the need to put regulations on currently. Um, but again, consult the, consult the guide on that. Um, so generally, this is, this is what you're going to see. So certain species have limits and certain species don't. So can you catch a wild fish and bring it home to put in your fish tank or private pond? We get that question all the time. And the answer is absolutely not. The only two legal reasons to keep fish are to eat it or have it preserved by a taxidermist, otherwise known as a fish artist. And a little tip there, <clears throat> if you are going to do that, is to take a picture right after the catch too, because they have to go through a process to preserve it. And it's nice for them to see what it looked like right after it came out of the water so they can give you the best, um, the, the, the best looking fish back for your dollar. And it's not a cheap thing to do. So those are the two reasons. The reason it's illegal to move fish from one water body to the other is, is because of disease, infection. And, and that includes live bait in the winter if you're ice fishing too. You can't put those small bait fish that you got from the the, the bait and tackle shop or you you trapped up at, a, at one pond, you can't dump them into that pond because you could be moving disease. You could be moving a species that wasn't in, in that water body. Um, one only needs to, to look at examples across the country. Grass carp and the Mississippi drainage is one prime example of why we don't move fish um, from one water body to the other because they have you know, they're, they're out of their norm in, in, in certain systems and they can create all kinds of havoc. So again, these are black and white. Do not move live fish from one water body to the next. Picking a great location is, your, is, is a key to catching and, and enjoying fishing. You don't need to make a trip out of it. it it's great to have a, a location or two or three right near your, 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 your house, right near your home that you can just go out for a couple hours um, by yourself or with your, your spouse or children or friends. It just makes it that much easier and, and you get used to things, especially if you're a beginner. It, you get used to um, finding the fish in that water body and that will translate into other water bodies. So pick a great location. And where can that be? Well, in, in Massachusetts, there are hundreds of fishable waters. And we talked about that a little already. Um, so many of them are overlooked. You can be on your way to school or work every day and you see that little pond you pass. Um, a lot of times that even the tiniest little ponds like the ones you see in the, in the photos here can hold tremendous amounts of fish and some large fish too. So don't overlook those, just make sure they are public and or if they are private, you have permission to fish on them. Um, so we are very lucky. The glaciers left us with a lot of water um, many, many years ago, even before my time. And, and, and there's tremendous fisheries in so many of these water bodies. So finding a fish in these water bodies, you, you, you really, you gotta key up on a certain few things. Um, you want to look for structure, and that's the most important thing. You don't want to go to the beach area. Like in the summer, say no one's on the beach and just cast out onto the beach area. There's literally no structure there at all. Fish love structure. They like they have to find their own home, and when they're home, their own niche within the home um, that they're living in. So look for structure. It provides cover and shade for fish. And structure can be down, submerged um, trees, big boulders and rocks those overhanging bushes that give shade on the shoreline, undercut stream banks, like you see this brook trout in right here. Um, weedy areas along the shoreline like this are excellent structure areas for fish. And of course, big tree roots <clears throat> here with this largemouth bass is cruising. So always look for structure when you're fishing. Deep water can be structure as well. Um, fish get stressed sometimes in the summer when the water gets really warm and certain species need that cold water. So they'll go down in the deep water. And that can that that structure for certain species, so don't overlook that. So <clears throat> in lakes and ponds, just to illustrate that point a little bit, so so we've got a little key up for you here. So um, so rocks along this area. So you wouldn't want to just walk up to this area right here and start casting out um, without. It could be just a barren stretch of water. You want you want to know where there's certain chunks of structure. So like a here with the rocks off the dam sunken cover, uh, be it as a big old tree that blew in there. Points are excellent right here at the drop off. So you would probably focus on fishing the point or this side of it, and not just casting out into this area. Of course, weeds are always good. Submerged stumps here. Lake basin margins, like we talked about, um, are very, very important. Um, so that, that would be 
this deeper water um, at the foot of the dam. Certain species really need that deep water, particularly trout or cold water fish. And, and you get to this, you get into them, you know, late spring and summer, they're gonna be looking for that deep water because that deep water is gonna be colder. So look for that um, drop off areas like this, stair step drop offs, and of course, flooded timber. Uh, beaver activity in certain waters can flood back into the woods a little bit. Um, and it can add to certain water bodies, but it can also make the fishing really, really good. So in lakes and ponds, look for structured areas. And rivers and streams <clears throat> are inherently a little more difficult as a beginner, I, I'd have to tell you. Um, and it's mostly just because of the moving water. Uh, moving water is a little more difficult to fish, but once you're used to it, if that's in your neighborhood, in your backyard, don't overlook it. Rivers and streams can be wonderful. I grew up fishing these small streams in, in just kind of West Central Massachusetts. And, and once you get to know them, it, they're not difficult at all. Fish will actually hold in certain areas and rivers and streams better. It's just a little more difficult to find them, excuse me, and, and you have all that flowing water. So if you're new, you're dealing with that flowing water and you don't know how to deal with it right away with that, especially if it's a fast current. So, um, so with rivers and streams, A is, that rip rappy area um, <clears throat> where it's well oxygenated. And a lot of times that could be man-made areas that move the channel in one direction or another. It could be natural to deep river bends, always hold fish, <clears throat> holes below riffles. Riffles are, are, are shallower areas where the water, um, where the water goes over these um, small rocks and boulders and gets well oxygenated. A lot of trout in particular and cool water fish will hold in that riffle or just beyond the riffle. Below wing dams and wing dam dams are put in place to control um, um, erosion in certain water bodies. Um, sometimes you'll see natural wing dams, but other times they're man-made. Um, so below those, of course, feeder streams coming into um, larger rivers, small little streams coming into bigger streams, coming into bigger rivers are always good places. You have a lot of churn in the, in the water here and more oxygen and sometimes the fish will hang right in there. And of course, eddies, which are areas just beyond natural structure that spins the water back um, toward the eddy. And again, more oxygen, um, nice habitat for the fish. So those are the areas you wanna focus on in rivers and streams. And, and you gotta get to know it. You gotta pick a river. And if you have one right in your backyard or within a close drive, just take a walk along it. Um, a little tip, if you're fishing rivers or particularly smaller streams, you wanna be very gentle on, especially the smaller streams, very gentle when you walk because fish pick up vibrations in the water call them, um, and a lot of that's your footfall. So you wanna be, and, and if you put that fish off, it'll, it'll take off or it'll hunker down and it won't bite. So bigger rivers it is not as much a concern, but smaller streams and smaller rivers, you wanna be very careful with your footfall. Um, and it's always a good idea to fish upstream as well. Um, the fish are a lot of times pointed upstream into the current. So you're approaching them from downstream, working your way upstream. So just little tips, but fish don't read the books we do. So try, trial and error really works good, but don't overlook rivers and streams. But if you wanna catch more fish initially, I'd say focus on pond and ponds and lakes. So featured sites in Massachusetts, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you our website now, and then we're gonna look at some, a, a few featured sites that hopefully will help you. Number one, this is our website. So if you, if you um, wanna know any information about fish and wildlife in Massachusetts, you would just Google Mass Wildlife. This site is gonna come up first and you can scroll down um, to the main tabs down here. Um, and if you want calendar information, um, what upcoming programs, any information about fish and wildlife, if you go here, wildlife, buying your fishing and hunting license right here. And if you've never done it, you, you click on it and it'll queue you up, it'll ask you a few things. And then you'll get in and it'll ask you a little bit more information. And once done, you'll have that. So the following years, you just go in and within two minutes, you have your, with a credit card, you can buy your fishing and hunting license. And then of course you have the fishing tab and the hunting tab. We're gonna focus obviously on the fishing tab here. And I'm just gonna talk about a couple things in particular, there's so much information here and we're always adding content. We're always adding content to our website. We have a great <clears throat> group of folks um, that, that help us to add content. So. Um, if it's spring or fall, you'd want to check the trout stocking report. I don't have the time to walk you through all that right now, but pretty user friendly. You'd click on that and you can, you can find where we stock based on water body or town. So you can queue that up, find out on a daily basis where we put the fish and the species we put them in. We stock um, trout in, from March through about Memorial Day. And then we take a break in the summer and because it's, it's a spring fall thing. And then late September, early October for a couple, three weeks, we're stocking again. 
the balance of them go out in the spring though. We stock about a half a million um, trout throughout Massachusetts a year and most of them go out in the spring. But what I wanna show you more, and there's a bunch of information, but we're gonna focus more just on the digital fishing map of Massachusetts here. And as you can see, it's pretty impressive and we're always adding um, sites to this. We're always um, updating our pond maps and, and with, with modern bathymetry and bathymetry is just um, the, the water depth throughout the water column. Um, and that's important to know when you fish, especially if you're fishing for certain species that seek out certain depths, seek out that colder water. So for trout, for instance, you will, in the summer, you'll want that deep water and it's good to be able to, to, to have that access. So this is just basically a whole screenshot of Massachusetts. So if we, if we zip in here, I'm just gonna show you a couple different examples. Say you're from the Berkshires or you wanna go to the Berkshires and do a little fishing. You can open up on, uh, we'll just click on this one. It's Lake Anoda, wonderful water body to fish very large Berkshire pond. And this is one of our uh, general pond maps that I'm gonna show you. So it, you're gonna start here with general fishing information, the size of the lake, the average depth, um, that kind of thing. And then you're gonna go down to recreational access to the water body, um, you know, where you can gain access to it. And some water bodies have just one, um, one um, boat launch, some have two or three, some only have canoe and car top launches on them, some have none. So they're, you know, so you, this is good to know and good to have. Most of all the ones that we feature do have um, access, um, boat launch access, and, and, and some have shoreline access too. So then you get down to fish populations within the pond. So this one pretty much has, covers the species. It's a deep two-story um, lake. So it has all this, most of the species of trout, it has all the, the warm and cool water species, um, with the exception of lake trout and salmon, and, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so fishing, and it talks about why a note is good for fishing and, 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 and the species to look for and the seasons to look for them in. You, you, you keep scrolling down and you'll see our modern uh, map with our, with our newer bathymetry, and this is bathymetry, just water levels throughout the water body. Um, depth, depth throughout the water body. So this is your launch in Pittsfield um, at Burbank Park. And there's a nice big fishing pier, by the way, there. And, and then you have deep water right off the launch and then it's gonna shallow up. And wherever you see the lines really tight together, um, when we're talking about bathymetry, that that's, means it's dropping really fast. So steep drop-offs. And remember, fish like those steep drop-offs. It shows you the points to look for, some islands, um, some bigger coves, and then the shallow coves for, for warm water species. And then, if, and then if you just go up a little bit, you can see where it's, it's very shallow in the northern part of the, the water body. So that's just a, a quick little example of, of a, a Berkshire pond. We can, we can go and take a peek more at the middle part of the state now. And, and this is, folks, you can really focus on this and play around with this and print these off and keep a whole collection of them. Say you're gonna take a, a little trip to, to the Quabbin uh, Reservoir area of Massachusetts where you can, you can click on this and there's information about the Quabbin Reservoir. Um, Pond Lake, we won't get into every link here. Quabbin Reservoir is a wonderful uh, fishery. It's open about six months of the year. It's really metropolitan Boston's um, drinking water supply, but it's as close to being in the wilderness as you can get in Massachusetts. It's just a beautiful water body to fish and you can rent boats on it um, daily, um, for, for very, very um, inexpensive. So then you're, you can come further east and look at all the water bodies in around the Boston and south of Boston area and down toward the Cape as well. You can zip and say you're gonna vacation on the Cape. The, the Cape is more known for its saltwater resources, obviously with the Atlantic Ocean surrounding it, but there are a lot of great freshwater resources on the Cape. So I'll just click on this one. It's Weequawket. People come to Weequawket, especially for pike fishing. Um, they love that. And it's more of a shallow water system. But again, here's your general information. Here's your recreational access information. And you just print this right off or you can keep it on your phone. Um, keep a, a favorites list of, of water bodies that you like to fish. The, the, the report on the fishing. And these are all done within the last couple of years. We've done these historically every 20 to 30 years. And anyone you see in color with the modern bathymetry has been done in the last four or five years. And we're trying to do all of them, <clears throat> update all of them over the course of the next few years. So all of them will have these wonderful modern bathymetry. Um, and, and the cool thing about this too, if you're out on this pond in a boat, 
or and you have this up on your phone, it will show you, your GPS will show you where you are in relation to this map. And it's a great handy tool when you're ice fishing as well. You can be walking from the access site or, or you know, the access site right here on the northern end of Weequawkee, you can be walking and it'll show you where you are on the pond. So really neat tool for the angler, um, available to everyone just right on our website. So, so don't disregard that. If, you're, if you don't know where to fish in Massachusetts, this is where you wanna go. You wanna go right to our website. Um, so not only do we have a tremendous amount of fishing information, we have all these water bodies you can, that you can fish. And there are streams on this too. <clears throat> And, and some sites along the ocean, some piers and, and that access uh, locations along the ocean too. So I just don't have the time to give you the, the, the three hour tour, but this is um, definitely your resource for all things fishing. So we're gonna, we're gonna stop sharing that and go right back into the, the PowerPoint here for you and continue on that journey. So hopefully once you've, once you've got a place to fish and you know where to target your fish, remember now you, you look for structure at these water bodies um, and always have a backup plan. I always say that, especially um, if it's a, a busy weekend or in the middle of summer, a lot of people are vacationing, say you're down on the Cape, um, you could um, have in mind a certain water body, you get there and there's very little shoreline access to fish. There's the boat launches are all jammed up, have one or two or three other water bodies nearby there um, that you can explore because there's no shortage of them as you can see. So have a backup plan particularly in busy times. So get the right equipment. That is huge. And you cannot, uh, I cannot overstate that. I see so many people showing up at our fishing events um, with the sentimental stuff, the stuff that grandma gave them or, or their mom or dad gave them or grandpa gave them. And it's so cool. And it's neat, it is sentimental to be fishing with something that, that someone in your family uh, fished with before or something they picked up at a, a, a tag sale or flea market for very inexpensive and they want to try it out. So invariably, a lot of times we are giving them our equipment to borrow and showing them how to use it. And at the same time, maybe showing them how to update that equipment, put new line on and, and that kind of thing. So if you start from the right equipment, it's so much easier. So uh, in, the, in the right equipment, if you're just starting, it's a simple live bait setup. So a simple hook, a sinker and bobber rig, and I'll show you that in a bit. Push button spin cast or spinning rod and reel is the one you generally want to start with. Um, and, and lightweight short rods are very appealing for beginners, particularly young ones. And if the young um, beginner is this age, you know, three or four years old, that's fine. But if they get up to seven, eight, nine years old, these are a little bit too short. The, the distance in your cast has a lot to do with how long the fishing rod is. So if you get these little ones, it's going to limit um, those older children um, in terms of casting. So while these rod and reels can be great, but I would say just for the younger set from like three, four, five, six, maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, you get much older than that. You really want the full five and a half, six, seven foot rod. And it's no problem for a seven, eight, nine year old um, child to, to, to wield that. But these younger ones, it's fantastic to have the small one, to have a little casting plug and to get out in the yard and, and have a ball. So this, these are some of the things you're gonna need to get you started. Um, on your fishing journey. So the best rod and reels for beginners are gonna be your, your spin cast or push button rod and reel or your spinning or open face rod and reel. Um, the bait casting rod and reel and the fly rods are great. It's, it's not rocket science, they're not super hard to, to learn, but you really need someone showing you and working with you a little more. They're wonderful tools in the arsenal. This one just gives you more distance in your casting, gives you a little more specific, the line comes out faster. Um, and it's a little beefier for bigger fish. Usually you'll see professional bass anglers using these. You'll see them a lot in salt water. Um, and the fly rod is <clears throat> really specific to, to it's, it's another challenge and anglers like to challenge themselves. And that, now I know people that started fly fishing, that's wonderful. And they generally had someone walking them through kind of a dedicated mentor to help them. Um, or they just liked the idea of it so much, they really worked at it and, 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 and got very, very, um, very good at it on their own. So, so if you learn nothing else, if you're a beginner and you don't know where to start, I would start with these. Um, if, if you have in mind that you, that you want to use one of these, you know, I'm, I'm not putting you off on it. I'm just saying these are a lot easier to use. So modern fishing line, critical part of your fishing outfit. Um, so you, so I want to talk about some basics here. There's, there's a few types of fishing lines. Each has its, 
it's good app, best applications and intended uses well and, and then you can mess that up completely by using the wrong line in certain applications so the five, five main types of fishing line are monofilament braided fluorocarbon wire and of course fly line and I'll, and I'll talk about that red rod and reel type in a little bit. Monofilament line is is the most common um, line you're going to see on most rod and, most modern rod and reels. It is it has so many uh, pluses. It has a few drawbacks, but one of the big pluses is it's inexpensive. It comes in a variety of colors. Um, it has some stretch, so it has the ability to be malleable. You're not going to break it really easy. Um, and it'll last. It'll last if you take care of it for a few years on your rod and reel combination. It's not going to last like some of the other options, but for it, it it's it's inexpensive. It, it'll give you enough years out of it that you'll be like, wow, it's that's that's the go-to line. The drawback in it, there's two main drawbacks. The first one is it has a memory. It, it likes to be in the form it was just in. So if you have it on a rod and reel and you haven't used that rod and reel in a year, two, three years, even though it's been sitting and you'll want to sit, put put those rod and reels in a cooler, um, darker environment as if exposed to the sunlight or extreme temperature changes, it weakens the monofilament. Monofilament is plastic line. So it'll weaken it and the breaking strength will be a lot less than what it normally would be. All line has a breaking strength rating and they put it on a machine and it breaks at two pounds, it breaks at five pounds, it breaks at 10 pounds, it breaks at 20 pounds, it breaks at 100 pounds. <clears throat> depending on your application. So obviously the 100 pound breaking strength line you're gonna use out in the ocean. You're gonna use it for monster fish. Uh, but the two to four to six pound, you're gonna use it for smaller freshwater fish. So they have breaking strengths and that breaking strength can be weakened if the line has been compromising by compromising being left out in the sun, stored out in the yard for months at a time. And that, that, that ultraviolet light can really damage monofilament. Keep it in the shade, keep it in the garage, keep it in the basement somewhere out of the sun and in a, in, in a relatively steady temperature profile. So monofilament, inexpensive, comes in a lot of colors, very, very easy to use and, and, and learn. Just know that it can tangle pretty easily if it hasn't been stretched. So once you've taken it out of the package and put it on your reel, or you've taken that rod out, you haven't used it in two or three years, stretch it, just walk out 75 to 100 feet and give it a good, really good stretch and then reel it back in, uh, keeping some tension on it. And there's so many great videos out there showing you how to load line onto a reel and how to stretch it and prepare it for, for use. So the two, the, so monofilament's probably the best line for beginners. Braided line is multiple strands of line, kind of all um, engineered together, has a, a much stronger um, diameter to, to strength ratios. It can last a lot longer. Um, but it can be tough on your guides. It's a lot more expensive. I'm talking 100 yards for 10 or $15 expensive. So it's not cheap. Uh, whereas monofilament for that 100 yards, it's two or $3. Um, and it's, you'll, you'll pick up your bite quicker. You'll feel the fish biting quicker. Um, but conversely, that fish will feel you on the other end. So with monofilament, that stretch helps the beginner. It's like you pick up the rod, it's stretching. They can't necessarily feel you when they, the, the fish is picking up its bait. But with a braided line or even fluorocarbon line, and we'll get into that in a second, they feel you, you feel them. And if you don't set the hook quick, they're going to drop the bait and go or drop your lure and go. So it has its pluses and minuses, but monofilament is the go-to. The other kinds, the fluorocarbon is, is a fluorine, um, single strand of fluorine, which is, um, it disappears in the water better. It's, it's a bit stronger, um, but still can break down in the sun really easy. You don't you don't want to really load your hole. You can, but you don't need to load your hole um, reel with that because it's expensive. You can just use it for leader. And leader is just what you put on the end of your line before you tie on your lure or your bait. It gives you a, like three or four or five feet um, of, and, and for fluorocarbon, it's, it, it's invisible. So the fish will only see your bait. They might not see the line because fish have really good eyesight. Okay, and then there's wire. And wire is really good for toothy critters, so big pike. Uh, pickerel, um, some saltwater fish. So that wire is going to keep when they bite your bite your lure, they get the line. They're not going to break the line. A lot of times, if you just use a monofilament, you accident you're targeting bass, but you accidentally catch a pike, they're going to snap your line and take the lure with you. So wire has its applications, and in some saltwater applications, the entire reel is loaded with wire for like tuna and in marlin and those type of fish. So um, so it's application by application, um, but for the beginner, monofilament's your friend. And most rod and reel combinations, particularly spin casting rod and reels, are going to be loaded, um, preloaded with monofilament already. 
Uh, but there's enough videos out there and we have some on our website that show you how to spool your reel with, with monofilament line. And the last line is fly line. And that's dedicated to a fly reel, fly rod and reel outfit. The weight of the line, the weight of, is impregnated into the line and you wouldn't use that for anything other than a fly reel. So that's good. the quick and dirty on fly line, on fishing lines. Um, you don't need to know more than just the breaking strength. So you, you know you're going to go for whatever bites maybe and whatever bites could be a big fish. So you want to cover yourself. So I'd get like an eight or 10 pound figure. Maybe you'd catch a four or five or six pound fish. So that eight or 10 pounds is going to cover you. So, so it won't break if you're not as, is tied securely um, and the line is not degraded uh, again by temperature extremes or sunlight. So don't go with really light lines like two or four pound tests because they break pretty easy and don't go with really heavy lines because again, they're, they're applications for really, really large fish or saltwater. So just kind of know the sweet spot in between, I'd say eight to 10 pound fishing line for most applications if you're just beginner. So the other things you need, <laughs> you get your rod and reel, you got, it's loaded with line, and now you have the line hanging off the end, you have to know what to put on it. So for a simple bait setup, you're gonna use, um, um, obviously you're gonna, you, you've gotta catch the fish some way, right? So you're gonna use a fishing hook. Um, here in Mass Wildlife and the Anglo Education Program, we highly recommend the circle hook. <clears throat> what the circle hook does for you, um, especially for beginners, it allows you to um, catch fish without that, um, hook setting motion, which is, which is exhilarating for people that have done it. It's like, Oh, I got a bite. So you pull the rod back and you try and drive the hook into the upper lower jaw of the fish. Well, this, the circle hook is designed to let the fish swim and you just slowly reel. And usually it turns and catches the fish because of that wide gap in the upper lower jaw. So really great to have it. It, it lessens delayed mortality in fish. So a lot of times you, if you're using a standard J hook or like, like these over here, um, or, or your, your standard Carlisle or, or the long shank J hook. So if you're using those, a lot of times they will swallow it or they'll get it down in the gills and, and you'll set the, you'll have to clip the line or you'll pull that hook out and you'll do some damage by getting, by way of getting that hook out and you'll set the fish free. It'll swim off and later on it might die, it might, it, you know? So again, the, the circle hook is the much better choice to use. Um, and in, in fact, in certain regulations, certain states for freshwater and now saltwater, you have to use circle hooks because it helps so much with that, that um, delayed mortality. So, so you get your hook on, you'll want, uh, if you're just beginners, you want some way to, to, to indicate if you have a fish um, biting. And they, these are your, your floats or bobbers. They're strike indicators. They even have them for fly fishing. They're just little, little round things on your line so you can see if a fish is tapping or taking your line. What you wanna see, is it moving? Um, and or disappearing under the water column, then you know a fish is biting. And then if you're using a circle hook, you just slowly start reeling. Like I say, if you're using a standard hook, you would, you would try and set the hook in the fish's mouth. So just keep in mind with a hook, you have a front point and a rear point. The front point there is a business end. If it, if it goes in you, it's gonna hurt, but the rear point is the called the barb. And, and that, that's the one, that the second point there in, in this graphic that is gonna hold onto that fish a little bit better. We, in, in this program, we file down all those barbs, get rid of them. We don't notice much difference in, 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 in hook rates and catching fish at all. If you just keep a, a relatively tight line to your fish, the fish come off the hook a lot easier. And if it were to go into your buddy, your friend, your mother, your father, it'll come out very easy because you don't have that barb. So that's a safety measure and it's, and it's good for releasing fish if you're just catching releasing. We'll talk more about that after. Um, so other terminal tackle you can use if you're big into um, lure fishing, uh, swivels are really important to have because they keep the twist out of your line. A lot of lures have ball bearings and they have twist in them so that you, you use, you tie the swivel right to the end of your fishing line and then you'll clip the, the lure um, with, with the front clips on these, you'll clip the lure to that. And then you can change lures relatively easily. And then you see on the bottom, you see weights and sinkers. These have applications, whether you're using a strike indicator like a bobber or not, Sometimes you want more casting ability, so you'll put a little bit of weight, these small little um, split shot here, um, the ones you see to the left in your screen and the weights, so you'll just clip it under the bobber. And if you're, especially if you've got a wind in your face, you'll be able to cast into that. Um, some bobbers, as you can see, have the weights already on, attached to them, which is really handy. Um, and then there's applications, you see the larger weights where you're not gonna use the strike indicator on the surface. You're not gonna use a bobber or a float. You're gonna be fishing off the bottom. So you want a heavier weight. It's the weight 
<coughs> excuse me, of what's on the end of your line that gives you the ability to get the, uh, on, on a push button rod and reel or spinning rod and reel or a bait casting rod and reel. It's what, what the weight of what's on the end that propels um, that your bait out into the water. So you need a certain amount of weight. So I would say if you're gonna take the bobber off, which gives you that weight, you're gonna to have to put, counter it by putting a little bit bigger weight on to, to be able to bottom fish and cast out far enough. So these are the little tips and tricks you'll learn as you go. But this is your basic terminal tackle and all you really need with that rod and reel loaded with line, a few, a few bobbers, a package of hooks and some weights and you're good to go. Okay, so now you've got your rod and reel, you've got your, your line, your terminal tackle, you need to know how to attach things to your fishing line. So, and you have to do that with fishing knots, folks. Sorry, you can't use the, your, your shoelace knot, the, the granny knot, the over, simple overhand knot. It really won't work. If you're catching tiny fish, yeah, in a pinch, it'll work. It, I see people do it all the time at events, but you really should learn a couple of fishing knots. It'll help you out. And there, there's so many, they write books on them and there's many great online tutorials for, for fishing knots. So three that we use regularly in the angler education program is are the clinch knot, the improved clinch and the Palomar knot. Um, the, and the one to go to is the clinch knot, one of the strongest knots in the world. The, the improved clinch just loops it back one more. It takes one more step and makes that much stronger. And if you're tying lures, there's nothing like the Palomar knot. It, it's rated a top five like fishing knots for breaking strength in the world. So those three are the ones that we use for that reason. When you're talking about fishing knot terminology, so when you're watching anyone um, do knots or you're reading about it, you're always going to hear them talk about the tag end and the standing line. The tag end is the end of the line that you would put through the eye of the hook and the standing line or the running line, it's often called, goes back to the reel. So they'll, they'll be talking about crossing the tag end with the standing line and, and, and turning the hook. So just be aware of that basic terminology. Um, that's going to come through with, with any type of knot um, that you're tying, especially fishing knots. So, so the clinch knot is your friend. That's the one you want to really learn um, by memory to be able to tie even in the dark. So, um, if, you know, in any application. So in terms of learning to cast now, now that you have your rig all set up before you go out, it, it's good to know how to cast and proper hand position is your first step to learning to cast. So when we're talking about the push button rod and reel, the one on the lower left here, you want to hold it with the reel sitting on top of the rod. And the reason for that is the rod's bending strength is designed where the, below the, the, where the guides are. So you would bend it down. If you're doing it the way the, the, the illustration is on the right with a reel underneath and, and then you've got to reel it backwards, it's not ideal. Everything is backwards and, and, you're, you're, and the rod is a bit compromised and it's breaking strength. It, it's, its rib is on the wrong side. Not the end of the world. If that's how you like to do it and you're used to doing it that way or that's how you learned, keep doing it that way. You'll catch fish. It's just a little awkward when you start. You really should start um, with the way on the, on the left with the reel sitting on top. Now it's just the opposite with the spinning rod and reel combination. You're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna have it uh, with the reel underneath mounted under the rod. As you can see on the top here, this gentleman's hand the post of the reel is is between two of his fingers and the reel mounts under. I see a lot of people get at events with the spinning rod upside down and reeling it backwards. It's very awkward. So again, if it works for you, it works for you, but that is definitely the incorrect way as a beginner to start. So in learning how to cast um, the push button spin casting rod and reel, um, we're going to, we're going to walk you through this right now. And of course, no better way to do it than just to get out and practice, 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 because it's all about timing when to release that button, when to push the button kind of thing. So here's a quick little tutorial for you. Jim Legacy, Mass Wildlife Angler Education Coordinator. And today we're gonna give you a quick introduction to the push button spin casting rod and reel. The most engineered reel, um, and anything more engineered is typically easier to use, and this is no exception. This is meant to, the reel is meant to sit on top of the rod. There are um, people I see all the time using it kind of backwards. They're, they're, they're using their forefingers to depress it and they're reeling it in backwards. It's designed to sit on top of the rod using your thumb to depress the button and then reeling it forward. So very, very simple. The magic is in this button when to depress it and when to let go. So you're going to face the water. You're going to depress the button while you're pointing the rod tip toward your target. You're going to bring the rod back. Um, just a little ways, you don't have to go all the way back uh, into the trees, just a little ways beyond your shoulder and you're going to come forward fast. And when you come forward fast, you're going to lift your thumb up when, when you're pointing to the sky after you brought it beyond your shoulder. So like so, just like that. So really, 
really basic and it's just getting that rhythm down uh, when to let go of the button and um, if you let go a little soon <laughs> Your, your bait's going to go up in the air. If you let go a little late, it's going to go right down in front of you. So it's that sweet spot kind of in the middle. And that just comes with a little practice. It's a really nice user-friendly rod and reel. Um, and they're very inexpensive, great for beginners. And some people never leave them. They keep fishing with them all their lives. Jim Legacy, Mass Wildlife Angler Education Coordinator. And today we're going to give you a quick introduction. So the next rod and reel to use, um, folks are gonna kind of graduate to, and you can start with it, it's perfectly fine, is learning to cast the spinning rod and reel combination. And um, like I said, this, the push button one is so easy and so user friendly. This one requires a few more steps and, and, and this, this gentleman's gonna walk you through those steps. Jim Legacy, Mass Wildlife and Angler Education Coordinator here with you today, showing you the spinning rod and reel movement and the way to use it. So with a spinning rod and reel, um, it's a little um, less engineered in that it doesn't contain the line um, as well as the, like the push button, for instance. So you have to be mindful of tangles in here and keep control of the line a little bit better. It's meant to be mounted on underneath um, the, uh, the spinning rod. You'll see a lot of people uh, using it upside down and then you have to reel backwards. Um, the rod is also designed so the bend is down where the guides are. So you want to mount it in the proper place and hold it in the proper place. And for me, it's usually my middle finger and ring finger. Uh, I put the post between those two, um, get a good grip. And if you really want a long cast, especially if you like saltwater fishing with one of these bigger ones, you'd want your, your, your opposite hand on the bottom of the rod. Um, so to um, effectively cast it, you have the bale, this big, this big um, object you see on the front of the reel, and then you have the spool holding your line. On that, <clears throat> basically the, the bale just kind of, when you turn the handle, it brings the line in. So you'll want the largest part of that bale um, to be as close to your forefinger as you can get it. Um, that's kind of critical when you cast. You don't want it down here and have to kind of grab it like that. You want to comfortably able to hold the um, the, rod and re the, the rod and reel combination and have that as close to your finger as you can. So then next step after, you're gonna face the water. You're gonna um, get that largest part of the bale under your hand so your forefinger can grab it. You're just gonna take it and lift it to the rod, just like that. Facing the water, you're gonna flip the bale over. That's step number two. You're gonna bring the rod back slowly because you're gonna have line hanging off the end. You don't want it to tangle only a little ways beyond your shoulder, then you're going to come forward fast. And when you get to about this position, you're going to be letting go of the line. So you just lift your finger up there like this. Then you just flip the bale back over. Some um, have very um, good um, reel ratios and ball bearing systems that you can just turn the handle and it flips the bale over. But most of them, it's a little clunky. So you just flip the bale over and start reeling in. Really, really simple rod and reel uh, combination to use. A lot of people start with it. Um, I would just say that if you're using monofilament line, that you can get some tangles in here if your line hasn't been used in a while, you've stored it or it's brand new line. So not a bad idea to stretch your line. Um, so learn how to stretch your line out before you go and you'll have less tangles in the spool because that can get a little frustrating. But other than that, it's a wonderfully easy rod and reel to use. All righty. So we got our equipment, we know how to cast. Now we have to figure out what we're gonna put on the end to catch some fish. So using the right bait is um, very critical um, and nothing beats live bait. I have to say that, I mean, in doing all these events, we, we do have people that just absolutely don't wanna put anything alive on a hook. And I certainly understand that. It's <clears throat> where, you know, some people just can't stand the, the idea of, um, you know, whether it's a worm, a mealworm, another fish, um, impaling them on a hook and I get that. So small dense pieces of uh, food will work just as not just as well I shouldn't say that shouldn't lead you down that that path but they'll work I've seen cheese sticks work chicken cooked or uncooked hot dogs work well because of the thick skin and it kind of stays on the hook um, a little bit better than some other food items the problem with the food items is it does appeal the smell the texture the taste it does have an appeal to fish <clears throat> but it, it, you have a hard time keeping it on the hook so that's why cheese sticks, hot dogs, when you're actually using food items, go a little easier on your cast. Don't, don't cast too hard because a lot of times the food items will fly off and nothing is gonna beat live bait. Um, 
whether it's worms, mealworms, crickets, you know, um, shiners, which are small, which are small um, groups of fish that you can put on the end of the hook. That 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 appeal, that movement, that live nature appeals to the nature of all fish. So that's going to work best. Um, but you can you can still hit it out of the park some days using food items or even lures. I always tell people to kind of avoid lures initially. Um, you'll go into the into a store to, to get some bait and you'll look and the, a lot of these stores um, have complete walls of, of lures and they all look good to me. I mean, they all would, <laughs> I'd buy them all if I could. They, I mean, they all look like fish or crickets or worms or whatever. They all look really good. Um, however, probably a small percentage really work on a, on a regular basis. So um, that's why I say, and they're expensive. I mean, the average lure is two, three, four dollars, even more sometimes. So if you're just starting out, you don't know if fishing is really your thing. You're only going to do it once in a while. I think live bait or food items are probably a better bet. The three um, most common types of live bait I've already said are, are, are worms or otherwise called crawlers, um, composting worms, trout worms. They come in a variety of um, names and in different species, but um, they are all slimy critters <clears throat> that live in the soil, basically. And then on the bottom is my favorite, the mealworms. And I will admit side by side, the worms are probably working better. They'll, they'll work better than a mealworm. I think they, they have more appeal to fish. They give off more of a scent. They're gonna move more in the water. And, and it's by and large, typically a bigger meal for fish. So if you're really starting out um, and, and you wanna catch more fish, worms is probably a, a better way to catch more fish. The only issue with worms is keeping them um, alive and keeping them good between fishing trips. They, they have to be kept cold. I mean, literally cold in the 40s. Uh, for temps, most most worms anyways. And a little side, most all worms, there were no worms in North America uh, prior to the settlers. So they have done some damage to our soils. So it, 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 that's why I always recommend the mealworms. I think mealworms are pretty much ubiquitous throughout the planet and they work really good. They're just keep them cool and they'll last in that larval state. And the mealworms, what you see on the bottom here, it is an insect, it's a darkling beetle larvae. You can buy, these in, in pet stores, because people feed them to their, their reptiles, amphibians, and birds. You can buy them alive or dead. The live ones, obviously, live bait, they're gonna work a little bit better. And I prefer them because they, they don't get your hands all dirty and slimy, and they're easier to keep for long periods of time, um, just in a cool place, in a cool, dark place. And then the ones on the top are your, your classic pond shiners, in this case, golden shiners. And they're, you know, very, very, uh, you know, as fish get bigger, they're looking for a bigger meal. So they're appealing to larger fish. So they're all also a lot more expensive. Uh, you know, a, do a dozen shiners can be um, pretty off-putting in terms of how much you're paying for it. Um, so that is, you can also um, trap them yourself. You take a bait trap and put it in, in, a, in, a, in a water body and bait it with some bread or, or um, cat food or dog food and come back the next day or over a period of days and find these. They can get in, but for some reason they can't figure out how to get out of these little conical or square bait traps. And then, but make sure if you're, if you're moving those fish and using them at other water bodies on your hook to catch fish, that they're dead when you leave or, or you're just not dumping them in that water body. We've already talked about that. So please make sure of that. So hooking live baits, <clears throat> here we have the three, the, again, the same three and how to hook them. The mealworm is pretty easy. You can just puncture it right through, but the best way to do it is to hide the hook as best as you can, like you see right here. You're, you're putting the entire um, mealworm through the hook so the fish mostly just see the mealworm. Um, the, the earthworm or the night crawler, you're just kind of, for lack of a better term, you're just sewing it on three or four or five times. And you, you don't want to really put the, if it's a big long night crawler, the entire thing on, you want to break it off and, and, and you know, because what, what's going to happen is the fish are going to strike that big, long piece that's not on the hook and, and rip it off your hook and you just gave the fish a free meal and you didn't catch the fish. So it's good to just break them into smaller pieces. And then, of course, the shiner. The two main ways to put a pond shiner on is uh, under the dorsal fin and above the backbone. So it can free swim. It can breathe. It can act normal in the water. And, other, and the other way to do it is to, to put it through the lips. I don't prefer this way. Some people like to send it out that way, it gives more of a crippled presentation. But it also, to me, it, it keeps the fish from, because fish breathe by opening and closing their mouths and running water over the gills. So I think they live a little longer. And if the, the idea is to keep a, a bait fish alive to fish for you, I think that the, under the, the dorsal fin works much better. 
And again, we'll get into lures. Just as I mentioned, there are groupings of lures that work really well. Do your research. All I'm going to say about lures is <clears throat> that if you're going, identify what you want to fish for first. If you want to fish for largemouth bass or smallmouth bass or trout or striped bass, just Google search, um, just do a search for the best um, largemouth bass lures and you'll have the top five or the top 10. Um, do your homework first. Don't be that person standing in front of that the, the, the bait aisle looking up and going, oh my God, that one looks great. That one looks great. Because that's what they do. They, they look appealing to us, but the fish, they have no appeal to fish. You know? So even, even some of the ones that look um, just like it's natural, what it's, what it's trying to imitate. They say this frog, I have tried this many times and had very little luck, but this clear little topwater lure, I've had a lot more luck and I don't really know what that's trying to imitate other than maybe a wounded bait fish flopping around in the water. So we're not the fish, we're not seeing exactly through their eyes. So it's hard to know. So. I'd be, be cautious of lures. This taco box probably represents hundreds, if not a thousand dollars or more in lures, and probably only a small percentage of them um, really work on a regular basis. So just be careful. You can spend a lot of money on lures and not be very effective. So here's your simple live bait rig right here. And we're going to show it with a worm on it, but you could also show it just with a mealworm or a shiner. Um, see, here's the best way to put that worm on, just to, to, to put it on so there's not a lot hanging off. In this illustration, there's more hanging off. <laughs> there's your bobber, your little weight under your bobber, and then two or three feet of line down to your hook. And then you're going to put the worm on and cast out a very, very simple rig, nothing to it. If you're surface fishing or fishing near the surface, you'd use the bobber here. And if you're, and if you're fishing under the surface, down in deeper water, you'd put one or two or three of these on and cast out, let it go down. And you just have to be more mindful because you don't have the visual to see the bobber. You'll have to watch the rod tip moving or your line moving. Um, to see if something is striking. So very simple rig. It, it, it doesn't, fishing doesn't have to be complicated. So <clears throat> speaking of complicated, <laughs> accessories to bring while you're fishing. Um, and, and there's going to be must-haves and, and things that just add to the experience. So the, the things you really should have, obviously, we all know, um, we all know some of these. Um, I always recommend eye protection if you're out fishing. Um, protecting yourself from the hook, but also the sun. The sun is very powerful. So if, if you wear a polarized pair of sunglasses, it's gonna be helpful. You're gonna have confidence because you, you know you're protecting your eyes from the sun and any swinging hooks. And you're allowed to see into the water column a little better because the glass has cut down the glare. So that's why I put this front and center. That's probably one of your best tools for fishing. And they're not expensive. I've seen polarized sunglasses down as cheap as $5. And of course, as much as <laughs> $200. Don't be that person. If you're just starting out, just get something to, 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 to protect your eyes and allow you to see in. So a pair of fingernail or toenail clippers, very critical or, or some way to cut the line. Uh, and then what, some way to remove fish. These are a variety of tools and sky's the limit here. I just like a simple pair of needle nose pliers or cheapo hemostats you can get at any drugstore. Um, but there are specialty tools for removing hooks that sometimes are better <clears throat> than other, other simpler tools. So just... Uh, just keep it simple at first, but some way to remove a fish hook. Sometimes the hook isn't just right in the, the outside of the, the upper or lower jaw. Sometimes it's down in the cheek a little bit more, or it's embedded good enough that you really need some leverage. And that, that needle, pair of needles plier or hemostat is going to give you leverage to get that hook out. Um, if you're in any watercraft, any time of the year, I always recommend a personal flotation device, life jacket, PFT. Um, um, especially it is the law between September 15th and May 15th to protect you from hypothermia. If you go in, you're, you're going to stay on the surface and be able to get to the shore because um, the water's awful cold that time of year. It is the law if you're in, in, a, in, a, in a watercraft, a canoe or a kayak in particular, between September 15th and May 15th, you need to have a life jacket on you. But I always say keep it on you all the time. At the very least, even in the heat of the summer, be sitting on it and be, be able to access it really quick. Um, if you're any kind of fishing, the sun is so strong now, sunscreen, obviously, and if you're fishing in, in the warmer month, set dusk and dawn, when most of the mosquitoes and or other biting insects are out, um, you'll want some, some, um, some way to protect yourself, and you don't have to apply it to your skin. Some insect repellents are pretty strong, though, so you can apply it like to the cuffs. Um, you know, you might have a, a higher collar or a handkerchief you could tie around you or the brim of your hat. So you don't necessarily have to put it on your skin, but there's enough um, bad press about mosquitoes these days, in particular, and at dawn and dusk and on those humid days, humid and rainy days, they're gonna be out all day. So protect yourself. 
with that. Pretty common sense stuff. Accessories that enhance the experience, but I wouldn't recommend you run out and buy, particularly the one in the middle here. Don't buy a boat right away. Have a friend that has a boat <laughs> or be able to rent a boat um, because boats and, and or trailers that they sit on can be pretty um, pretty pricey. And I, <laughs> I have one and I spend more time working on the boat or a trailer than I actually do fishing out of it. So um, the, the better way to go if you want a water conveyance, some way to get into the water would be a pair of waders whether it's hip boots or chest waders will get you offshore a little bit more away from the trees and the brush. But then, then you could invest in a kayak uh, or canoe. Um, and those are relatively inexpensive um, if you're gonna look for a watercraft before you'd run out and buy a boat. Baby steps here. Know if you like fishing first and then go on and on and, and, and spend your hard earned money on, on other ways to improve the experience. Um, things that I would say are important if you're keeping fish, and we'll talk about that a little more as a fillet knife and some way to keep them fresh before you leave the water. If you're into just knowing the length and you should, certain species, you have they have to be a certain length to keep. Um, and in certain states, they do it by weight. Uh, most, most of the time it's by length though. So um, you, you'd want a method of, of checking the weight or the length. And then a net, if you're, say you're fishing in a boat um, and or kayak or canoe, or even in a river where, where it's a bigger fish, you get the rod in one hand, it's always nice to be able to scoop the fish out with the net. So not a must have, but certainly does enhance the experience. So recommended accessories when fishing with young children. That's a big one. <laughs> and, and it's all about keeping them happy and entertained um, after all. I mean, it's, you, you don't wanna ruin the experience for someone with any pastime at all. Experiences can be ruined so easily if not done properly. And sometimes it's completely unintended um, and, and it can go wrong. And then you'll want a little buddy that can go fishing with you, but he or she had a bad experience and, and they won't, and it's gonna take some convincing to get them back out there. So snacks, definitely some water uh, or, or, or their favorite drinks to go along with the experience, make it a picnic, uh, bug spray and sunscreen, change of clothes because you know they're gonna end up in the water, right? Um, so, so a quick change of clothes in the car, um, socks in particular, they get wet, you know, they're very uncomfortable, especially the water's a little cold. So have that nearby. Of course, the PFD, the personal flotation device or life jacket is very important if they're like this young lady, especially if they're fishing in, in, a, in a, off a dock, a boat, a kayak or canoe where they don't know how to swim yet, but it gives them the confidence, even fishing offshore if they should fall in. And barbless hooks, we always recommend barbless hooks. We, we use them in our programs. Number one, it's, it's better for the fish, for removing. It's so easy to remove a barbless hook out of the jaws of a fish. And or if the worst happens and someone gets it punctured under their skin with a barbless hook, it comes right out. It's still going to hurt. It's still going to be a big owie, but it's going to hurt a lot less if that barb is removed. Target the right fish, folks. And I always say this, if you're, if you're a beginner, just anything that bites, get that bait in the water and, and get a feel for setting the hook, reeling in the fish, handling the fish. Don't be picky when you're just starting. Um, some, some people will see certain species and go, oh my God, that's pretty, or I, I love eating that fish, I wanna target that fish, and they've never fished before. So always just kind of you know, get some repetition on you, a feel for actually casting and reeling it in and setting the hook taking the fish off. So anything that bites, I always say when you're just starting. Popular fish species are sunfish, members of the sunfish family, like this little fellow's holding a bluegill here, a bass, which are larger members of the sunfish family, trout, pike, and pickerel, to name a few in freshwater. So popular sunfish, the big three in Massachusetts and throughout most of New England are gonna be pumpkin seed, uh, bluegill, and, and calico black bass, or otherwise known as black crappie. Of, the, of these three, the calico has the potential to get the biggest. I've seen them as big as two pounds, which are just ginormous calico bass. Um, the pumpkin seed is, is the really prettiest one of all. They have um, like the, these teal vermiculations on the side of their face and the little um, reddish orange dot back here. And then these little, these little um, um, orange patches all over the body, which I think gives them their name of the pumpkin seed, uh, but really pretty sunfish. And then the bluegill, poor bluegill, <laughs> not quite as, as pretty. In their mating colors, they can be very reddish on, on, on the underside of the fish here. And they have this big dark blue, almost black patch on their, on their, on their gill cover or perculum that gives them their namesake. All of these have, <clears throat> and, and we'll show you um, how to handle fish in a little bit. All of them are spiny rayed fish. So, so when they're just fresh out of the water, uh, flapping around, these, these uh, fins are gonna be raised and the spines are gonna be raised to warn you, they're as sharp as hooks. So just be careful in terms of how you handle them. Very popular, very obliging from say 
early April through mid-October when the water temps are 60 degrees and above, they're eating, they're laying their eggs and reproducing. So they're very, um, they're gonna be inshore. Um, as you get into a, a deep summer pattern, I would warn you though, the water temps get 80 and above, they're gonna be easier to catch early and late. So say before nine o'clock in the morning and kind of like after five, when the sun is lower on the horizon, the waters haven't warmed up enough because they do get a little low when the water temps get really warm. They'll seek out deeper water, they'll bite less um, in the heat of the day. Sunfish fishing tips. They're the perfect for families, perfect species for families and new anglers folks. Anyone looking to just catch a fish because they are plentiful, easy to catch, and so much less te technique involved. You're not looking at fancy lures, just looking at a simple live bait rig like we showed you, and they are so obliging, meaning they are ready to bite, they're ready to offer you a lot of fun. A few tips, start by fishing in lakes and ponds. Don't have to uh, worry about the moving water component. They're a lot more abundant in lakes and ponds, and fish during the warmer months, like I, like I said. Nothing wrong with ice fishing or fishing, early spring, late fall. Fishing is great whenever you can get out and do it, but you'll have more fun and you'll catch more sunfish, say May, June, July, August, September into early October. October can be that month when it all goes to kind of analogous to April, when you can get an 80 degree day, or you can get a 40 degree day with cold water temps and, and a heavy wind and rain. So October's that transition month and beyond. So um, those are the months you wanna focus on if you're a beginner, really smack in the summer, you can't go wrong. So those are your sun fishing tips. Um, and it's a wonderful fish to go after. So next on that list would be your freshwater bass. These now freshwater bass are just bigger sunfish, largemouth bass and, and, and smallmouth bass in particular. We have a lot more largemouth bass in New England than smallmouth. Smallmouth are more of a cool water fish. They're actually rated as a cool water fish. It's like water temps a little bit cooler and they like a, a more of a rocky cobbly substrate and some deeper water access. Um, they're also um, easily found in a lot of rivers because again, cool water, more oxygen in the water um, in, in rivers and offers more better habitat for smallmouth bass. Largemouth are more of a, a shallower weedy species and, and can take a little bit more higher, uh, higher water temps. But both can get pretty big. You know, largemouth bass can get in, in Massachusetts easily four, five, six pounds. And we've had some every year we catch eight, 10, 12 pounders. So they can definitely be very large and down south even bigger. Um, in smallmouth bass, you're top ending at, you know, four, five, and six pounds generally, even though the state record is over eight pounds, um, but that's extremely rare. So they're a little bit smaller on the potential size scale than largemouth, but they're both very large sunfish. Bass fishing tips. So largemouth and smallmouth bass are primarily caught during the summer months and in fall months while they're, you know, summer, you know, when they're spawning and feeding a lot more, and it's, you can catch them all year, but they're a lot easier to catch um, during, during the, you know, say May to early October. You can catch them in the winter through ice fishing. They're popular ice fish, but they kind of all kind of school up into one or two certain areas of the water body and finding them can be difficult in the winter. Um, they, they've had pictures of, of um, smallmouth bass in particular in these deep lakes, hundreds of them over one chunk of structure during the winter. And they just kind of hang out there until the water temps warm up. And the fish in the winter are gonna be more down on the bottom because the warmer water is, is, and it's only a couple degrees warmer than the surface water is gonna be down on the bottom. So finding the bass in, in, in terms of ice fishing is a little more difficult. So it's, it's, they're easier to catch in the warmer months. Popular bait for, for large mouth bass, um, are gonna be, you know, live baits are gonna be night crawlers, crickets, shiners. Um, and then lures are gonna be surface poppers, soft plastic baits. Um, are typically favored in, in anglers, you know, for, for artificial lures. There's so many largemouth and smallmouth bass lures, but, you know, nothing beats taking a, a fish off the surface. So those surface plugs are just fantastic. You get those hot, humid days, late afternoon, they're going to they're gonna attack those surface poppers. So just a, a fantastic uh, um, option for you. But the soft plastic lures work really good too. Um, but, you know, they, they do have the, uh, the you know, the, that, the, the bad connotation of being plastic. So please try and keep them out of the water when you're not using them. Popular um, baits for smallmouth bass are similar. Uh, in terms of live baits, crayfish work better for, for smallmouth bass. Helgramites, which are just dops and fly larvae, they're big. You can collect them in streams. Just do a Google search and you'll find videos on how to collect them. And shiners, again, pond shiners, you can collect them yourself or buy them. They work really good. And it's the same kind of artificial lures that you use for smallmouth are gonna work for uh, largemouth as well. Um, 
And of course, you can have success trolling in deeper water, particularly in the summer, and just trolling in general, even if it's just um, behind a, your, your paddling canoe or kayak. You get a lure that'll go down five or 10 feet. You can have a, you know, 100 feet behind the canoe or kayak. Just your own propulsion, you're paddling away. You can catch bass just doing that. Um, and then, of course, look for structure. Um, lily pads, down trees, those big, long submerged rocks, old stone walls and certain uh, uh, man-made water bodies in, in rocky areas in general work really good for bass. Trout, uh, we stock about a half a million, about 500,000 trout between the spring and the summer, a lot less in the, in the, I mean, between the spring and the fall, a lot less in the fall. Um, it's just a couple of weeks we're, we're stocking certain water bodies that, that will allow them to survive into the fall through the winter. In the spring, we're putting them in a lot of water bodies um, as put and take fisheries. So putting them out, hoping that you'll take them home and eat them and, and certain water bodies that they can survive through the summer. But the predominant amount of trout we're, we're stocking in the, from, from March through May. Um, and, and the three species um, that we stock are brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout. Um, tiger trout is a functionally sterile hybrid between a female brown and a male brookie. And we stock a handful of these, sprinkle them around the state every year. And they're good fighting fish. Um, they're, they're a mule, you know, they're, you know, fi figuratively, they're, they're not going to breed, um, one, once you make that hybrid, but they're, they're ornery and kind of like a mule. So that uh, anglers say they're a little funner, more fun to catch because they're really stubborn and really tough to, to, to reel in. So that is, and that can happen in nature. You can get, if you get concentrations of brown trout and brook trout, tigers can come out of it, but we don't see that much in Massachusetts because we don't have a tremendous amount of, um, trout spawning habitat. So we make some, and then uh, we, we produce them in one of our hatcheries and, and, and token stock them throughout the state. Trout are very popular fish. They're, they're one of the, the most sought after fish to eat, um, stocked in, in mo so many waters throughout the state. And you wanna go to our website, like I showed you previously and check our trout stocking report, particularly in the, in, from March through May. And then again, in late September and October. Uh, best locations to find them is gonna be clean, cold water. Um, trout, again, are a cold water species, so they like water temp 70 and, and below, and most of them like it in the 50s and 60s, and some of them even still, like the lake trout that you'd find in Quabbin and Wachusett Reservoirs, you're going to find in, you know, between the upper 40s and low 50s, they're going to seek that water temperature up. Diverse habitats, um, streams, rivers, lakes, and ponds, they like it messy, they don't like, they don't like channelized streams, they don't like um, manicured uh, lawns down to the water body. These are all bad for most water bodies. So they like it. Lots of structure in the water, down trees, things that create a lot of turbulence within rivers and streams. And, and again, in those lake habitats too, they like deep water habitat and, and, and shallower water habitats. So again, that, that's what it's, they like it kind of messy and diverse. Um, popular lures and baits include, um, you know, tight a variety of tied flies and you can use flies even on your spinning gear. You don't have to be a fly fisher, fly angler to use flies. And of course, spinners and um, spoons. So what we call metal baits um, work really, work really good. Those are your, your lures and live baits. Um, you know, all the same ones I already showed you and then some pelletized baits um, work really well. So the live baits are, you know, again, all the ones we've talked about, mealworms, night crawlers, um, aquatic insects, and there's so many of those, and terrestrial insects, shiners and crayfish, pelletized paste, salmon eggs, small little chunks of worms, and of course, engineered baits that you can buy in jars in, in, in stores. So um, we have a lot of trout fishing tips on our website as well. So pike and pickerel, these big toothy critters are a blast to, to fish for, particularly sought after our northern pike in certain waters, in, in only a handful of waters throughout the state. Um, and these get very large. I mean, these can go 20 plus pounds and be, you know, three to four feet long and put up tremendous fights. They're very popular to catch in the winter. Um, and the chain pickerel are the smaller cousins uh, to the northern pike, and they're very easy to identify between the two. The chain pickerel um, has this chain-like pattern, and they have this long black teardrop where the pike don't have that. And the pike just has these white plotches, and, the, and, and they, they, can, they have the ability to grow a lot larger. Um, but they, they're very, when they're the same size, just look for the teardrop in kind of the chain pattern. You'll know it's a chain pickerel and they both are, have different um, regulations in terms of size and how many you can keep. Pike and pickerel fishing tips is, you know, spring and fall commonly caught in shallow vegetated areas and they do occupy pretty much the same areas 
within um, rivers and lakes. Summer and winter, they're more abundant in the lower part of the water column, um, particularly in both the, once the summer pattern has set up and that really, um, the heat of the summer, the surface waters, you know, 80 degrees, you're gonna have a, a lower layer that's down in the 60s. Um, they're gonna be looking for, they're more of a cool water fish, they're gonna look for that cool water habitat. And same thing in the winter, they're gonna be, they're gonna be set up more on the bottom. Uh, bait, again, live bait shiners, whether it's alive or dead, large uh, shiners, um, the biggest ones you can, you can buy or, or, or jig up yourself are gonna work really good and they don't have to be alive. They, they get pretty lazy, they, especially in the winter, they're not moving a lot, they're slowly moving throughout the column and if they see something that's laying there dead, they'll pick it up and eat it. So um, big, large shiners, whether alive or dead. Artificial bait runs the gamut. <clears throat> I know spinner baits and buzz baits work really well, kind of imitating wounded bait fish moving really fast through shallow water. Spoon spinners, crank baits, all of those same things. So again, uh, I caution you on lures. If you're focused on pike and pickerel, which are big fun fish to catch, uh, do a top five or a top 10 search on, on lures for them in a modern search because the lures are always coming out and some work better than others. And, and it's gonna be the same for pickerel. Locations are very similar and bait is very similar, folks. So what to do after the catch? <laughs> and often asked questions at all of our events, <clears throat> safe handling, best practices for catch and release, best, best practices for catch and keep. And of course, the ever asked eating question. Uh, let's get into it. So a little bit about anatomy about fish. Um, fish are um, cold blooded, um, animals, vertebrate animals adapted to living in the water. And by cold blooded, they just don't have an internal regulatory mechanism to keep their body temperature at one steady state like we do. We're warm blooded. We have an internal regulatory mechanism to keep our body temperatures roughly at, you know, 98.6, but everyone varies a little bit. Fish, it's a great adaptation being cold blooded to be able to survive in all these different water temperatures within reason. Certain trout, once it gets above 70, most all trout are going to be really stressed and probably aren't going to live um, in, in that habitat much longer when the, when the water temperature is on that level. Um, so, so it's an adaptation to being able to survive it, but thriving it is a different thing. So they're all going to have optimum water temperatures allow them to, to spawn, which is when they lay their eggs, fertilize them, the eggs get fertilized and the, and the young ones can hatch out. So that water temperature and then above that to a certain extent is when they're eating and thriving. For like warm water fish, once it gets really cold in the winter, they're just kind of hanging out, waiting for the winter to end. They're not thriving, they're surviving because they're cold blooded, but they're not particularly active. Um, and the same for trout, it's just conversely, trout like the colder water habitat. So in the middle of summer when it gets really warm, if they can't find that colder water habitat, so they're stressed and they're not gonna make it. So cold-blooded vertebrate animals that have to living in the water. With that said, they have all the same senses as we do. Good sense of sight. They can see really well. They can hear really well. They have internal ear bones called otoliths. It's, they're in their skulls, so you will find no external ears. However, fish can um, hear really well in the water column. Sound travels roughly five, six times faster in the water than it does moving through the air. So they can hear you talking, walking, um, banging around on your on your boat, kayak, or canoe. They can hear really well. And some fish get used to that and aren't put off by it. And other fish are really skittish and are put off by your sound, your skimming stones, your dog in the water, that kind of thing. And will move and then not be interested in biting your lure or your live bait. So just be aware of that. They have a, a great sense of touch, um, of taste, uh, and of smell. They can smell within the water column. That's why I tell, I tell people when you start the live bait fish, leave the bait out for a little bit. Don't just cast reel, cast reel, because it, it takes a little while for that smell to, you know, to, to get through that area you're trying to fish so the fish can smell it and come in. Um, so all the same senses. I would caution you that they don't have eyelids, so they can't close their eyes like we do. So look for shade line structure that will protect them from the bright sunny days. Um, that's a little clue to finding fish, not just because of the, the, the structural component that they need to survive, but because of the sun's impact on them without being able to, to close shade their eyes, they're looking for shade lines. Um, this particular fish, smallmouth bass, is gonna have spiny rays. There are fish with spiny rays and fish with soft spines. So just know the difference. Um, this is easily, you can find a lot of this information on our website, but in, in, in any search, a lot of, of different searches and YouTube videos, you'll find um, you'll find uh, the different species and know them. And before you handle them, a fish flopping around the spiny rays is doing that to protect itself. So 
and know how to handle those species. Fish also have a sixth sense called the lateral line that runs down the side of their body. You can see it in the illustration right here. It's uh, thousands of microscopic um, little pores that allow them to sense vibrations within the water column. So larger fish um, can sense smaller fish and smaller fish stay in schools by, by utilizing this, this lateral line system. And of course, then you have on this fish, all of the, the fins that allow them to move through the water column and the, the, the mechanism for breathing is right under the operculum or gill cover, it's the gills of the fish. Never a good idea to handle a fish in the gills. If you hook a fish in the gills, we always recommend you, you clip the line and let it go, particularly if you see blood um, streaming down under this um, gill cover. So do fish feel pain? That's a question I get all the time as well. And science has come way around to that now. We know that fish do feel pain. They're sentient beings. Whether they feel pain on the same level as we do is still unknown. Science is always evolving and asking those questions. Um, so I would just say that, uh, you know, in no uncertain terms, they're feeling the, the hook in the mouth. The, the, however, the, the, the mouths are bony. They have very bony mouths and they do eat other fish with spiny rays. So how much of that pain they're really feeling is unknown, we're not fish. But I would ask you to, to be um, kind to the fish to a certain extent, don't just throw it up on the bank and let it suffer if you wanna keep it. We'll get into those methods in a moment here. So safe handling of fish. Um, I'm, I, I'm gonna show you three species right here. And the, and the number one I wanna talk about is the bluegill or the pumpkin seed or other members of the sunfish family. The best way to handle it is to take your hand from the head area, like you see here, and just rub it over those, the dorsal, pelvic, uh, spine area, and pectoral spines. They all have, those fins all have spines. So if you rub your hand over it, it lays them down and renders them harmless. And then you can take the op your opposite hand, like you see in this illustration, this picture, and, and pull the hook out or take your, your, your hook removing tool and use it. Um, don't just, that fish is gonna flop around a lot when it's first caught, don't just try and grab it unless you know that they're soft rayed fish. It's best to um, handle them um, by knowing the different species you're, you're, you're handling and the soft, the, the spiny ray fish are a lot more common, the sunfish and bass. And of course, if they're big bass like these right here, these are four and five pound bass, you can pick them up by their mouths. They have very large mouths and they all, all fish, by the way, have teeth, but in the, in the sunfish species, bass included, they have, they're they very fine, like a nail file. So you can put your thumb and forefinger right in the mouth, get a good grip and, and lift them straight up. Don't hold them like that after you do that. Don't hold them horizontally without supporting them underneath. So you, you go from that, take your hand and bring it up and support them underneath if you're gonna hold them um, horizontally. If you're holding them vertically, just by the mouth, like you see in this illustration, in this picture right here. And then trout, of all the species of fish, they don't like to be handled. They like to be handled the least. So um, wet your hands. You should wet your hands with any fish if you're catching and releasing. But keep them in the water as much as you can. Gently remove the hook and let them and and and, and give them a splash go um, to get them back into their to, to their um, to their habitat. They they can they they have probably the the. the, the on a term of on a scale of one to ten in terms of handling stress. I would say they're more on the one side, where there's the catfish species, the sunfish, the bass are more on the, the seven, eight, nine, ten side. They can really take it, they're tougher. Trout can't really take it. Um, so best practices, which is a perfect segue for catch and release um, fishing is don't play a fish to exhaustion, please. Enjoy the fight, but land the fish before they are played out and deeply stressed. This is not gonna do the fish any good. I know that's the fun of fishing is playing that fish, but play it relatively quick, get it in, take the hook out, and get it back in that in that water in short order. Wet your hands. Uh, fish have a mucus coating that protects them from disease and infection. So if you wet your hands, you remove less of that mucus coating, which is healthier for the fish. Use barbless hooks. We talked about that, either taking a, a flat pair of pliers and pinching that barb down or a file and filing it off. And you can also buy barbless hooks. Way healthier for the fish in terms of um, hook removal and healthier for you if you get a if you get a hook under your skin. And then try circle hooks. Circle hooks are, are, are becoming more and more in vogue with all um, types of species of fish that you'd fish for. And it's the law in certain uh, circumstances. I know in Massachusetts for certain species in saltwater, you need to use circle hooks because it's just easier on the fish. You usually catch the fish outside in the upper or lower jaw where you can access the shank of the hook and take it out. They're not swallowing those hooks as easy. And it's easier to get hook sets. You don't have to do that 
motion, you just slowly start to turn and, and generally the, the, the circle hook hooks up in the mouth. Try and, and then release the fish quickly. I know everyone wants to fight that fish and then get it out of the water and run up and down the bank and show your parents and your friends and take pictures. Do it pretty quick if you're not taking the fish home to eat and or, and or keeping it as a trophy. The fish will be a lot better off if you get it out, take it off, take a quick picture and put it back in the water column. Best practices for catch and keep. Of course, know and obey all fishing regulations with respect to catching and keeping fish. And this means obeying minimum size and daily creel limits. And creel is just how many fish per day you can keep. Certain species in Massachusetts do have these laws and posts. So know that. Treat your dinner with respect, please, folks. Dispatch the fish, the fish as quickly and humanely as possible. I don't think it's too much to ask to, to humanely dispatch a fish. And to find out about that, you, there's YouTube videos showing you that. And there's, there's in both written and video format, you can find how to properly do that. Be prepared to keep the fish. And that means bringing a cooler with some ice. Be, be mindful of that. If you know you're gonna keep the fish, you wanna keep that flesh in, in good order and in, 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 in fresh until you get home. Um, so you, and clean and prepare it sooner than later too. So you might wanna write at the water body, if you know you're keeping that fish, know how to dispatch it, clean it, get it on ice in your cooler and, and you'll have a decent meal as opposed to something that might be somewhat degraded and iffy. Uh, and don't be selfish folks, please don't be selfish. I see this all the time, I call them bucket anglers, keeping the very tiniest of bluegill and pumpkin seed and yeah, there's no laws. On, on certain species of fish in terms of how many you can keep in size limits, but don't be greedy. Um, it takes a lot of effort to clean those little fish too. And they give you just a dollop of meat and it can mess up certain water bodies if you overfish, um, um, overfish even these smaller fish and these smaller fish have their, um, their value within the system too. And a lot of times these systems need some culling. They need some of these smaller fish to be taken out, but that doesn't mean you can come with two five gallon pails and fill them up and take everything out, um, a water body can only sustain so much of that. So don't be too selfish, spread the wealth. So after the catch, is it safe to eat your fish? Um, and so, so that's a question we always get. And one of the most important questions for, for people that, that their motivations are to actually eat the fish that they catch. So fish are high in omega-3 fatty acids and should be part of any healthy diet. However, there is a statewide advisory for pregnant women, nursing mothers, and children under the age of 12 to not eat wild-caught freshwater fish except our stock trout. So we bring this up because our stock trout are raised, um, they're essentially farm-raised in what we call hatcheries to size, to mature size within a year, two year and a half in, in a clean environment. So they're not exposed to many years of growth in a wild system where it takes five, 10 years to become mature and potentially exposed to mercury. These are advisories. And with advisories, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a cautionary. Okay, so it's, it's about developing. So young children, mothers that are pregnant, mothers that still wanna be pregnant, nursing mothers, it's all that de developing fetus or developing young person don't wanna be exposed to mercury. So those wild fish you wanna stay away from, but you can, you're plenty able to eat our stock trout. Um, and then, as you get older, you know, fellow my age or someone that's older, um, you know, well past their developing years, sadly, um, physically anyways, <laughs> maybe degrading mentally, but well past those years, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. And, and I, like, I like to enjoy fish, but I would say rather than taking that really large fish, that five, six, seven pound bass or, or pike or uh, or even saltwater fish, what have you, eat the ones that are just over legal, that, that they're gonna be a lot younger, they're gonna have, have bioaccumulated less potential mercury in their flesh, so, and, and the, the meat's gonna be tender. So you know, for, for largemouth bass, for instance, if you enjoy eating bass, the minimum size is 12 inches, and that's gonna be probably a, a four-year-old fish here in Massachusetts, three to four-year-old fish, so eat that fish, 12, 13, 14 inches, as opposed to the the 25 inch, you know, seven or eight pounder that's, you know, 15 or 20 years old here in Massachusetts. It's, so you can see what I'm saying. The potential is there for, for, more, um, for more mercury um, in the flesh of that fish. And for the ultimate on that, you'll want to consult the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, their website has a complete fish advisory list. And there's other things besides mercury too that you have to be mindful of. And, and if it's certain things, it's going to even be posted at the water um, letting you know that. And this doesn't at all mean that you can't go out and touch, feel fish, 
catch and release fish uh, and have a ball with fish. A lot of people, that's their motivated motivation for fishing. But if you're catching and eating fish, just know these. And then the, the last thing is to be responsible and ethical when you're out fishing. And I can't say this enough. This is pretty common sense stuff, but I'm surprised that a lot of people um, really need reminders or they didn't have good mentors when they were starting uh, their fishing journeys or their outdoor journeys. And just be respectful to the outdoors. Always leave the area at least as good, if not better than you found it. Um, my biggest pet peeve is littering and littering fishing line in particular. So please take all that out with you. That monofilament line is made of plastic. And if it's, and if it's buried under the leaf litter, it can be there for years and birds do like to, to, to make, make nesting material out of it. So please take that out. And if you see a ball of fishing line, it, it doesn't take much effort to, to remove it. Um, and when you leave, uh, respect other people's privacy and space. Um, that, that is huge. Certain people, uh, tend to, to had luck in one particular spot on a water body, whether it's a lake, pond, river, stream, and they and then they get a little ownership to that that that, and then they see someone there and they get a little offended that someone's in their space. And that and that's if it's a public water body, it's not your space; it's a shared space, and we all have to share it. So don't crowd anyone. Give everyone their space. Always practice safe fishing. We've talked about that with the barbless hooks and the swinging hooks and and that type of thing. Be mindful of who's around you. Whenever I see <clears throat> someone get hooked or bumped off the head with a lure or such, it's usually a brother or sister or, or mother or <laughs> son or something like that. It's a family member that's used to being really close together. So just be mindful of that, folks. Give yourself some space and practice safe fishing and, and you wear your sunscreen and your PFTs. Um, <clears throat> possess a valid fishing license so if you're 15 years of age and older no one understand current fishing regulations we talked about that um, always you know consult a, a current copy of the Massachusetts guide to fishing and hunting and that's right on our website um, right easily available on a PDF um, you can you can download chunks of it or or the, the entire thing or print out sections uh, release fish immediately if you don't intend to eat them or have them preserved by a taxidermist. We, we covered that. And don't release unused bait fish into the water. Um, again, the only two reasons to keep fish are to eat or to, to have them preserved. And if you can, without getting yourself into a pickle, report lawbreakers. If you see someone uh, breaking a fish and wildlife law, don't confront them ever. Don't crowd them or confront them. But if you if you see it from a distance and you happen to see their license plate or get a description in there, they're, they're doing nasty, egregious stuff like dumping, um, leaving a lot of their, their junk behind, littering or, you know, um, catching fish they shouldn't be or undersized certain species. It's not a bad idea to, to call that number there. And, and a lot of times the environmental police will investigate. So I want to thank everyone um, and, and for, for, for listening. This is quite long. Uh, there's a lot of great information if you're a beginner, and I want to wish everyone um, luck in their fishing journey. Fishing has is, is, is offered me so much pleasure in my life, and it, it's even given me my career choice. Um, but it's just a great way to connect with nature. So thank you for listening, and have fun out there. <laughs>